Hey everyone, welcome to the channel. Another month is over, and although the whole world has gone into lockdown, the developers behind some of the emulators for modern consoles haven't stopped moving forward. Thanks to their hard work, there's never been a better time to dig into video game emulation, especially if you're looking for a way to have fun and keep yourself occupied during this global health crisis. There have been a lot of changes and improvements to modern emulation just in the last month, so this video is a closer look at some of the more significant updates that a few emulators received in March, just in case you missed anything. I'm gonna try to keep things brief, so if you notice that I left something out, or if you have something else to add, feel free to drop a comment below. While you're down there you'll find timestamps in the description, as well as links to all of these emulators and their Patreon pages, so that you can try them out and support the people who develop them if you'd like. And of course, be sure to hit that subscribe button if you want to keep on seeing more videos from me. Kicking things off with PlayStation 3 emulation, RPCS3 received yet another optimization to the Vulkan backend last month. This update improved performance in many games, and while most of them see a modest boost of up to about 10%, some games such as Infamous and Tools of Destruction see improvements of 50% or more in certain areas. You may have also noticed that the Vertex explosions have been fixed in Tools of Destruction. This came from an adjustment to some logic which allows the Vertex range to be properly calculated under specific conditions. Thanks to these updates along with what we've seen in the last couple of months, this game is getting very close to being playable. However, there are still some random crashes and substantial drops in performance that keep this one classified as in-game for now. Speaking of compatibility, Virtua Tennis 3 is now fully playable, and Call of Duty Modern Warfare is in-game thanks to a fix to how this simulator handles invalid blend equations. In fact, this update has all of the Call of Duty games running much better than before, although they're still not considered playable since they do suffer from some graphical glitches, performance drops, and occasional crashes. Fans of anime fighters will also be happy to hear that the freezing and rendering issues in J-Stars and Dragon Ball Raging Blast 2 have been fixed thanks to some RSX improvements implemented in this last month. RPCS3 also received an update which allows users to spoof a PSN connection, and while it doesn't allow users to connect to the network or play multiplayer games, it does fix quite a few games which require a PSN connection to go in games such as Need for Speed Hot Pursuit. Xbox 360 emulation took another big step forward this last month with the addition of persistent shader storage to Xenia, meaning that this emulator now has a proper shader cache. If you're not already familiar with this concept, a shader is basically a small program that runs on your GPU and manipulates 3D images during the rendering process to apply a range of different effects. In Xenia and many other modern emulators, shaders are compiled as they're needed during gameplay, which causes some stuttering and slowdowns, especially early on in the game. Once they're compiled, shaders get stored in a cache where they can be reused without being recompiled. As a result, gameplay tends to smooth out as the cache grows and fewer new shaders are needed. In previous builds of Xenia, these shaders were only stored temporarily, so as soon as you closed out of a game, all of them would be deleted and you would once again need to deal with stuttering and choppiness the next time you started playing that game. But thanks to this new implementation, your shaders are now stored permanently in a folder called Shaders as they get compiled. You can still expect all of the usual stutters and slowdowns when you play a game for the first time, but as you build your cache and gameplay smooths out, you can now expect it to stay smooth even if you close out of the emulator and reload the game later on. The only real downside to this update is that games will take quite a bit longer to boot if you've built up a large shader cache, but that should be nothing new to those of you who have used other emulators for modern consoles. These shaders are also transferable from user to user, so if you have a friend who's beaten a game, they can share their cache with you so you don't have to experience any shader related stuttering at all. Just note that Xenia doesn't do much to validate the contents of your shader cache, so it's strongly advised that you only use shaders that you receive from a third party if you absolutely trust them. The Xbox emulator CXBX Reloaded saw some more audio fixes in March, including an update which fixed a regression with missing and looping dialogue which caused Mechasol to freeze before going into a mission, making this game fully playable for the first time. This update also affected some other games with similar audio issues, such as Indiana Jones where the background music is no longer stuck on a loop. There's also been quite a bit of work done behind the scenes to improve how CXBX Reloaded handles virtual emulation and reserving all of the proper memory addresses for all system types. And there was also some great news for Sega Chihiro emulation this last month, thanks to a fix to how this emulator handles software interrupts under certain conditions. 
this issue had been preventing further work on Chihiro emulation for some time, so while users won't notice much of a difference yet, this update paves the way for some real progress to how CXBX Reloaded emulates this Xbox-based arcade machine. Moving on to Switch emulation, the Ryujinx team started off March by continuing their effort to implement 32-bit support, and as a result they were able to get Mario Kart 8 Deluxe in-game at the beginning of the month. Shortly after, some optimizations to memory access as well as the addition of jump tables immensely improved how this game performs and brought it into a very playable state. The addition of jump tables also gave a slight boost to performance across the board by removing a bottleneck and executing CPU-dependent tasks. While most games only see up to a 10% increase in performance, a few games such as Captain Toad Treasure Tracker and some areas of Super Mario Odyssey got a performance increase of closer to 25-50%. to You may notice that this addition to Ryujinx causes games to take a bit longer to boot since the JIT compiler has more work to do up front, but it's a fair price to pay for this kind of improvement. And of course, Animal Crossing New Horizons is already playable on this emulator using a special build that was released through Patreon. You don't need to be a Patreon contributor in order to download this build, and Animal Crossing runs quite well on mid to high end hardware, so I recommend checking it out if you haven't already. Keeping things going with Switch emulation, Yuzu has seen a lot of improvements to the early access build this last month, but I want to focus on what's available in the free version of this emulator since that's what's available to everyone. Right at the end of February, Yuzu's shader cache got reworked slightly, and as a result Luigi's Mansion has seen fixes to reflections, some lighting, and the graphical glitch that occurred when using the elevator or going from room to room. Cutscene audio was also fixed in this game, as well as in Bayonetta and Sonic Forces thanks to some changes to the way that audio gets downmixed. There was also an update to how Yuzu handles certain textures which improved performance in Astral Chain immensely. Frame rates do dip quite a bit even on high-end systems and there are some random crashes, but this game is looking much closer to being considered playable. And a new setting has been added for an isotropic filtering which does a great job of smoothing out the models in some games, although using this feature may impact performance and it may cause some graphical glitches in certain games like you can see here. And rounding things out with Wii U emulation, the free-to-play version of Simu started March out with the implementation of asynchronous code translation in version 1.17.3. This process is also now done on a separate thread rather than on the same thread that's used for CPU emulation, and as a result of these changes, non-shader cache related stuttering has been eliminated in situations where a game runs into a large amount of new code, like many of them do when they hit the first loading screen. There were also some improvements to both graphics backends in this version, which fixed crashes in games that tried to use a depth texture with an invalid format. Thanks to this, as well as an update which fixed a crash in the OS Calendar Time to Ticks function, a few games such as Fatal Frame 5 and Bayonetta 2 have seen some big stability improvements, making them much more playable despite some issues with sound and graphics. This version also brought along some updates to the UI, such as a fix for how DLC shows up in your games list, and a button that allows you to easily check the requirements for online play against your current account settings. Version 1.17.4 brought along another minor stability improvement to the multi-core recompiler, which allows this performance-enhancing feature to work with even more games such as Xenoblade Chronicles X. However, some games like Kirby and the Rainbow Curse still have issues when using the multi-core recompiler. So that's a brief recap of what we saw in these modern emulators in March. Again, quite a bit has happened, so if you noticed that I forgot to mention something, or I left out an emulator that you wanted to see, leave a comment below so that it doesn't get missed. And if you enjoyed this recap, be sure to subscribe to my channel so that you don't miss the next one. April has already started out with some great improvements to a few of these emulators, and there's some pretty awesome updates still headed our way, so I'm really looking forward to sharing the next month's recap with you guys. But for now, Thanks for watching, try to stay healthy, and I'll catch you in the next one.